Father in heaven, this morning, Lord, I know I, I can't get up here and do this except that you would bless me. I know who I am. I know where I've been. I know those moments that I've doubted. How can I get up here and speak for you? Except that you've called us to tell what we know of Jesus. And I ask that you'd forgive my sins, Lord. Make me whole and fit to stand in front of your people. I, I pray that when I'm done, I could know that you're smiling because I've been found not eloquent, but faithful to your word. And we covenant with you this morning that when we hear the voice of Jesus speak to our hearts, we will follow him. We will follow the lamb wherever he goes. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm going to start in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which goes without saying is Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica. We're going to start in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, Jesus coming for the church, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Here's what I want you to notice about the way Paul talks about last day events. He, he has the same attitude that Jesus did when Jesus was forecasting the future. You'll notice Jesus is forever saying things like, let not your heart be troubled. Fear not. You, know, you, you believe in God? Come on, believe in me. It's always this, this attitude of reassurance, calming people down, which tells me something. It tells me that if preachers are always, always, always using last day events to scare the stuffing out of the congregation, there might be something wrong with that approach. Might be. Now, it's true, once in a while, a little straight talk is good, amen? Every parent knows that a little straight talk is good and well-placed from time to time. Every so often, you've got to tell your kids, look, if you do X, Y is going to happen. Don't do this. You will regret it. You've you got to do that once in a while. So sometimes it's a perfectly valid method to make a biblical point. But if it's the only thing a preacher does, if they're always selling the gospel by trying to scare people if it's always about the beast and it's always about persecution, that's probably not a biblical approach because we have hope. We have hope in Christ. We ought to have smiles on our face no matter what goes down around us. So Paul says, look, I don't want you to be troubled by anything I wrote to you in a letter. And the reason he has to say that is because, well, he's afraid he gave him the wrong idea with his first letter. And in the first letter, he describes the second coming in really vivid detail. I mean, it's vivid. You probably remember it. You've heard it at every funeral you've ever been to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus descends from heaven with a mighty shout and the trumpet of God and the graves are open and the dead come back to life and we're caught up in the air to be with the Lord forever. Back in the first century, that was such a vivid description. I mean, they had no YouTube, they had no TikTok, they had no special effects department, they just had the written word, and that was so vivid to them, they panicked a little bit in the church of Thessalonica. It's like, oh man, did you hear that letter that the pastor read in church on Sabbath that was from Paul, and it sounds like Jesus is coming back this week. Oh, that's good news. I don't have to put in my crops this week then. I can just ignore that. Jesus is going to come anyway, and I don't have to pay my taxes this year because there's no time for them to come and audit me if Jesus is coming back this year. I don't have to do any of this stuff because sounds like we got weeks left, maybe months. So they got the wrong idea. Paul sits down and writes them another letter. Not so fast, he says. There are a few things that have to happen before Jesus comes. And now we get our key text for today in verse 3. This was actually in the Sabbath school lesson this morning. Let no one deceive you. Oh, that's a big theme in Bible prophecy, deception, deception, deception. It comes up again and again and again, which is why God's people need to know where they stand on the Word of God in these last days. You will not be able to trust the evidence of your senses in the last days because, frankly, the miracles will be happening in all the wrong places at the very end. Fire comes down from heaven in the wrong place. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the second coming of Christ, will not come unless the falling away comes first. 
He's predicting the great apostasy that would take place within Christianity over the ages to come. Unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Somebody lays claim to the throne of God, and most of you know exactly who or what this is talking about. But today, I want to think about this from another angle and ask you a rather troubling question. Is it possible that you and I have anything in common with the man of sin? Is it possible that you have anything in common with the man of sin? I'm convinced this passage describes the greatest challenge that you're going to face before the second coming of Christ, but maybe not the way that you think. To unpack that thought just a little bit, let me take you to the pages of the Old Testament. Let's go now to 1 Samuel chapter 9. We'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. And I want to look at the story of Saul, the son of Kish. He's an ordinary young man doing a very ordinary average thing the first time we meet him. What's he doing? He's out looking for missing livestock, some donkeys that have broken out. He's like Every other farm boy who has ever lived throughout the course of history. It's not an unusual story until you start to read it really carefully. And then you notice Saul is not like every other boy. In fact, in some, reg in some regards, he's a little bit like Lucifer right before he fell from grace. The Bible says Saul is unusually gifted. The Bible says he's very attractive. He's very easy on the eyes. He's that young man walks into the room and the head of every young lady turns and notices him coming into the room. He's that guy I did not like when I was out shopping for a wife because you can't compete with the likes of Saul, the son of Kish. He's the best looking guy. 1 Samuel 9 verse 2. The Bible says, and he, that's Kish, had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. How handsome was he? The Bible says, there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. He's literally the best looking guy in the whole country. He's the Brad Pitt of his day, the Pierce Brosnan of his day, the Cary Grant of his day, the Ryan Reynolds of his day, the Sean Boot. No, I'm kidding about that one. It's like, <laughs> but look. He's the best looking guy in the whole country. In addition to that, it says, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Oh, he's the whole package, the real deal. He probably doesn't even have hair grown out of his nose or out of his earlobes and those little wings that you get on your back when you pass fit. Not that I'm bitter about how things are playing out. I, he's good looking. And one day, according to the story, the best-looking man in the whole country goes out to find missing donkeys. But what Stud Muffin Saul doesn't realize, at least at the beginning of the story, those donkeys are not missing by accident. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. It's entirely possible, in fact, that an angel has taken those donkeys out for a walk because Saul needs to be somewhere at a very specific moment for a very specific reason. Where? a little town called Ramah, where the elders of Israel have just called an emergency meeting with Samuel, the aging prophet of God. This is a story that takes place many years after Samuel responds to the call of Christ. Do you remember the story? It was my kid's favorite when they were little. Samuel, Samuel, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. And when you read that story, have you ever noticed? I mean, G Jesus seems to have this personality trait where he uses people's names twice. Mary, Mary, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Samuel, Samuel, you know who it is that's calling him in the night. I can't wait. I bet you hear your name twice at the resurrection. Sean, Sean, come on, time to go. It's Jesus. And in obedience to the call of Christ, Samuel has spent his entire lifetime helping the children of Israel understand exactly what it means to live as a free people in a covenant relationship with God. What it means to build a God-fearing nation in the land of promise. But now, in chapter 8, he's getting old. And the children of Israel are starting to wonder, you know, what's going to happen when Samuel goes? He's going to die soon. 
What are we going to do about leadership? So they call this meeting in Rama at about the same time the donkeys go missing. So you know it's not a coincidence. Samuel shuffles in. Gentlemen, what's going on? I mean, come on, a meeting Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock? What's so? I know you think I only preach on Sabbath and teach the pastor's class and maybe the odd prayer meeting here and there, but i got things to do. I've got evangelistic meetings to prepare for. I've got Bible studies going on. Why would you need a meeting at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon? And as he looks at them, they're all really uncomfortable all of a sudden. They're not talking. They're looking at their feet shuffling around, so you know it's bad. Finally, one guy in the front row elbows the guy next to him. He's the designated spokesperson. And he starts to speak up. Okay, Samuel, um, listen, we we got together a while ago, and um, yeah, we were talking about how much we love you and how amazing you've been as a prophet. Guys, I think maybe even the best since Moses, right? We think you're the best since Moses, and because we love you so much, We pooled our money and went down to the trophy hut right there next to the post office in Rama, and we got you a plaque. Look at this. It says, for 50 years of faithful service. And you can put that in your study and look at it. Every time you're a little discouraged, you can look up at that plaque, and you can see that we love you a lot. Really, guys, that couldn't wait till potluck? Two o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday for a plaque? Is that really what's going on? Because... People with experience know that when everybody butters you up all of a sudden, the shoe is about to drop, amen? Experienced people get it. Now, Samuel, there is something else, and this is hard to say. We we don't really want to talk about this, but we've noticed you're not the guy you used to be. You know, we love you, but my goodness, at church board the other night, you fell asleep halfway through the meeting. You snort a little bit. After the meeting, you couldn't find the keys to your ox cart. You looked for an hour. They were in your hand the whole time. And when you are awake, you can't hear what we're talking about. And so, look, we love you, but we've been talking. You know, your days are numbered, Samuel. It might be time to put together some kind of a succession plan. Well, guys, if that's what you're worried about, you think I don't know I'm old? You think I don't know my body hurts and I can't see or hear? Well, I know I'm getting old, and I have a succession plan. Don't worry about it. Got my boys all lined up. They're ready to take my place. More awkward silence. Well, Samuel, that, that's kind of the point. We, we don't want your boys. We're not comfortable with Abijah and Joel, not even a little bit. And they kind of had a point, according to the Bible. You wouldn't want these boys either. 1 Samuel 8, verse 3 says, The sons of Samuel did not walk in the ways of their father. In fact, it says they turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Now, that might be perfectly acceptable if you're running for office in 21st century America... But in the camp of Israel, that was inadmissible, unacceptable, because the only role, listen carefully, the only role for human leadership in in the original formula for Israel, the only role was to point people to God Himself. That's it. Read it carefully. In the beginning, the leaders of Israel didn't legislate anything. They didn't write and pass laws. They really didn't. They didn't line their pockets with the proceeds of public office. They didn't really make any decisions. It was more of a coaching role. Turn your eyes back to Jesus. Turn your eyes back to Jesus. Follow the Lord. It was just a coaching role. And if Samuel's boys were morally compromised, how can they do that job? Because they don't know Jesus themselves. So the old prophet has to think for a minute the same way you would probably have to think if somebody told you that your useful days were winding down and nobody wants your kids. Samuel has to let it sink. What are you guys suggesting? Well, here's what we're thinking, and and just hear us all the way out to the end, Samuel. We've been talking about this a lot. Now that we're settled here in the land of Canaan, and we're not slaves anymore, and we're free and respectable people, and we have culture, and we have industry, and we have college degrees, we're thinking that at long last, it might be time to grow up and become a real country. What do you mean, real country? God has made you better than a real country. You are here as His light in the world. What do you mean? real country. Now, Samuel, look, we knew you were going to say that. We knew it, but you're old. Take a look around. Every other country, without exception, has a king. Every other respectable religion, every other church has a responsible human being, a highly trained professional sitting at the top of the organization making decisions, and we're getting a little bit embarrassed. We still live like peasants here in the land of promise, and we think it's time to graduate from prophet to king. 
But that's not a good idea at all, guys. You know that's not what God wanted for you whatsoever. Honestly, Samuel, we we knew you would protest. You just don't get it because you're so ancient. It might be time to get an Instagram account so you can keep up with what's going on, Samuel, and a Twitter account and read some Barna studies and talk to the next generation. I think you're going to find out. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that here in the 12th century B.C. I know they didn't know it was the 12th century B.C., but work with me. The 12th century BC, every good professional leader, uh, every good professional leadership requires a king. That's how everybody does it. That's how things are done. And they were right. That's exactly how everybody else was doing it. But everybody else was not the kingdom of God. Everybody else was not the chosen people. Everybody else was not the remnant church. And God's people, saints, have never been like anybody else. We're supposed to be countercultural, not pro-culture. We are here as a light in a broken world. That's why it should start to bother you when people look outside the walls of this movement for inspiration on what our next move should be. I mean, really? Hey, Pastor Sean, have you seen? They they, they got this new mega church in town. Yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. They got 20 paid professionals on staff. They have a psychologist on staff. They have a Starbucks in the lobby. They get 20,000 people coming out every single weekend. Every single year, they put out a best-selling book. Have you seen it? Yes, I have. And my response is, so what? Is that what God raised this movement up to be? No, that's not us. And we are always talking about what everybody else has and what everybody else teaches, and we wish we could be like them. Then we're behaving like God somehow forgot and shortchanged the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is not another church. I wouldn't have joined if it was just another church. This is the prophetic movement of God, the remnant church of Bible prophecy. What it is. Samuel, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king, verse 6, 1 Samuel 8. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Bible says in verse 7, he got a really unusual answer. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. In other words, Samuel, go ahead and give them what they're asking for. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Now here it is again. There's our key text again. It's the same issue as the man of sin text, except that it's in a different context. This also describes the biggest challenge we face before the second coming of Christ. It has everything to do with who sits on the throne. It has everything to do with who sits on the throne. Lord, how could you tell me to give them what they're asking for? This is wrong. I don't like it. God says, you think I like it? I know it hurts. Believe me, I know. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. But I'm not going to force people into my kingdom. I don't make slaves out of people. If they want slavery, they're going to have to go somewhere else. And if you read the story carefully, that's actually what they're begging for, another round of slavery. Another round of slavery. It's amazing what people are willing to do and willing to lose because we just can't bring ourselves to believe that God might know what He's doing, that He might be all the leadership we need, and that He might actually keep all of His promises. The people in this story have a direct connection with the God who made the heavens and the earth. They actually have the spirit of prophecy in their midst, giving them counsel from heaven themselves, and they're asking for more slavery. They want a new Pharaoh. A new Pharaoh. And before we cluck our tongues, wag our fingers, saying, what a bunch of dummies, we should probably remember that we do exactly the same thing. Same thing we did when Moses went back up the mountain to get a hard copy of the Ten Commandments. Right? He didn't come down as quickly as the people thought. Aaron, we got to talk. Moses disappeared up the mountain. He went into the cloud. We haven't seen him in weeks. What's going on? We, we're, we're a little worried he's not coming back. Well, guys, you can relax. You know that the cloud is actually... Jesus, right? It's the presence of God. I think there's not too much to worry about. Yeah, but that's the problem, Aaron. That's so out of touch for us. We're not allowed on the mountain. It's just Moses. We actually have to stand back from the mountain. How do we relate to that cloud? We can't relate. What are you guys asking? Well, just hear us out. We've been thinking, you know, we know it's not really Yahweh. We we get that, and we wouldn't really use it that way, but We've been thinking about those golden calves we used to see back in Egypt because that's kind of tangible. We're used to those, and we thought if we had one of those, well, again, you know, it's, we understand that's not really God, but if we had one of those, that would be a little more relevant to our culture. 
God actually points to that story in 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says in verse 8, the request for a king is according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. My people have done this again and again and again and again and again, God says. They refuse to let me be on the throne. It's the biggest problem we face. And it happens when we stop believing, when we behave exactly like the man of sin, climb up on the throne of God, even sometimes just for a couple of minutes. I'll just sit here for a couple of minutes, make a couple of quick decisions, and then I'll get back off the throne and let God run it again. We do it over and over. Look at the example of Abraham. Abraham, what is it, Sarah? I knew something was eaten at you. What, what's going on? Well, I've been doing some thinking, Abraham. I mean, God said you're going to be the father of this huge nation, right? Yeah, that's, that's what he said. We won't even be able to count them all. Right. And, 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 and then I was thinking, you know, Messiah is going to come from this line too, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. What is your point, Sarah? Well, here, here's what I've been thinking. I mean, look at you, Abraham. You're, you're as good as dead. You're so old. I mean, that's what it says in Hebrews 11. That's actually Bible. The Bible says he had one foot in the grave. He's as good as dead. Look at you, Abraham, one foot in the grave. You're too old for this, and I'm too old for this. How are we supposed to have a child? Here's what I've been thinking. You know God helps those who help themselves. Yeah, that's Ben Franklin. That is not in your Bible anywhere. That's not in the Bible. That's Benjamin Franklin. He was a deist. Don't take his word. You're as good as... Here's my plan. What's your plan, Sarah? I think I want you to sleep with my servant. In what universe, gentlemen, would that sound like a good idea to you? I mean, how in the world does Abraham do this? He, do, he goes and sits on the throne for just, you know what, let me think about that. I'm going to sit on the throne for a minute. Yeah, that's a great idea. Go get Hagar. We're still paying the price for that one, right? The descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac can't stand each other. It's still going on. And that's just a few minutes trying to occupy the throne. You try to occupy the throne, you'll make a bigger mess than you realize. And that happens in a number of ways. Sometimes we want to occupy the throne because we want to force prophecy to happen the way we think it should. Don't take over. Let God run that show. Get back to doing the one and only thing God ever asked us to do, and that's preach the three angels' messages. Period. Period. Sometimes you want to do it with your salvation. You want to help God out. I'll help you out here, Lord. I'll make a few of these decisions, and I'll, I'll, I'll work off some of the sin. And He's like, no, that's not... You let God be on the throne. It's our biggest challenge. We don't give up the reins to our lives very easily. We don't. The biggest problem you face between now and the second coming of Christ, let me, let me mark it this morning. It is not the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7, although that's a big, big problem, and you should be paying attention to what's going on right now. Big problem. But it's not your biggest personal problem. Your biggest personal problem isn't the decline, the collapse of Western civilization, although that should concern you if you're trying to raise a family in this moral landscape, we wasteland we're living in now. It's getting tougher by the minute to raise godly kids, but the collapse of civilization is not your biggest personal problem. Your biggest personal problem is not a bad decision coming out of the Supreme Court. Your biggest problem is not an executive order coming out of the White House. Your biggest problem is not another stupid decision coming out of the Congress. Your biggest problem is not the people who sit next to you in church. Your biggest problem is not your wife. Your biggest problem is not your husband. Your biggest problem is not your kids. Your biggest problem is not your boss. Your biggest problem is not your parole officer. Your biggest problem isn't even your mother-in-law. The biggest problem you have right now is sitting in the seat you currently occupy. You're your biggest problem. It's this tendency we have to try and take control, behave exactly like the man of sin, climb up on the throne of God, even for half a minute, and just pretend we're in charge of something. It always fails. If you can't get that impulse under control, if you can't let God be the king of your heart, then you're headed for a world of hurt. I mean, pay attention to what's going on. Last few years, just a warm-up. This place isn't going to get better. Not going to get better. What do you think is going to happen when it absolutely collapses? I mean, think about it. Shootings in grocery stores and schools and nightclubs and pandemic, forest fires, moving more forces to the Pacific because we don't know what's going to happen in China, NATO piling up armies in Poland against the Russian border. NATO freaking out, the economy teetering on the brink of collapse yet again, finally figuring out that all of the highest officials 
in this land have been lying to us for generations. The whole system's rotten to the core. When it all blows up and everybody starts to panic and it feels like the Spirit of God has been lifted from the earth and Moses is never going to come back down the mountain and Jesus may never come, then at that moment when the whole earth is panicking and it plunges into midnight, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond to that? Because if you have not yet given up your claim to God's throne, if you have not yet handed over the reins to your life, you're going to find it really, really hard to resist the first person who comes along and offers a little bit of peace and security. And let me tell you, that person is going to be very persuasive, bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men. If you're still trying to run your show yourself, you are going to stumble. Now, pay attention carefully, because the next few verses in 1 Samuel 8 have shaped world history since the moment this happened. It changed everything, including your lives. This is one of the most important stories you need to understand if you want to understand the book of Daniel. Now, before we continue to read in 1 Samuel chapter 8, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Maybe let's review 12th grade history. I'm not sure in the United States of America what grade you cover Reformation history, but it's somewhere there. But You're an educator. When do you do Reformation history? You don't. They don't teach it at his school. (laughs) They do. They do. Let's review it, whatever grade you covered it in. Back in the early 1500s, right after Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, the Reformers begin to think about everything that's transpired over the last 1,000 years or so. And they think all the way back to the 4th century when Christians actually begged the Roman emperor to come in and run the church and be the king. It's an exact parallel. What we did in Christianity is an exact parallel to what Israel did with Samuel, asked for a king. It's exactly what we did. Right after Constantine marches into Rome, 312 AD, he brings an end to the persecution of Diocletian. Boom! Ten-year persecution comes to an abrupt end. Everybody rejoices. And you'd think that things would go well at that point, but down in North Africa, this big controversy emerges. Why? Well, during the persecutions, a whole bunch of clergy ran into the woods to hide. It's known as the Donatist Controversy. When the persecution was over, they came back to get their jobs back. And nobody wanted them back. You guys ran in the persecution. We don't want you back. In fact, we're invalidating every baptism you've ever performed. Invalidating. It's a big controversy, and they can't fix it. And somebody says, you know what? The Roman emperor, he's friendly to Christians now. Let's ask him to get involved. And they asked him to get involved. And he was too busy running the empire, so he has his local bishop in Rome run that meeting. And he rises in prominence for the very first time. After that, we have another problem. A renegade priest starts to teach an unbiblical view of the nature of Christ. And again, when the church couldn't solve the issue, they appealed to the Roman emperor. We literally asked the emperor to take over the reins of the church. That's literally what we did. It's like you have a big debate on the floor of the general conference session. I know that's hard to imagine, right? And they can't come to any resolution, so we put in a call to the Oval Office and asked the President of the United States to come in and make the decision for us. It's the same thing. And once the emperor sets foot in your church, good luck getting rid of him. Good luck getting rid of him. This new model in Christianity was not at all what Jesus envisioned. We saw it in our scripture reading this morning. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but not so among you. No king in Christianity. Wasn't supposed to be a king, but we wanted one anyway, just like Israel. We begged for one, and we married church and state. And that marriage of church and state led to more than a thousand years of darkness, complete with torture chambers, where we burned people if they didn't accept our opinion. Everybody following? Getting quiet. We come to the 1300s, about a thousand years after Constantine. God starts to wake people up all over the Western world, all over the Western world. Tyndall, Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, all the reformers. You know the stories well. And what those reformers did was open up the pages of this book, and they started to sort through all kinds of things. You know the things they wrestled with. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, the the five solas. But underneath all of that, there was a bigger question they were wrestling with. Go back and read the things they wrote. The Reformation was about all kinds of things, but the essence, the heart of the Reformation was an attempt to undo the Roman king. That's what it was. So the German princes start to break away, and suddenly up in England, Henry VIII gets an idea. Man, if the German princes can break away, I can break away. And he needs to break away because he wants to change wives, and the Bishop of Rome won't give him an annulment. 
So he launches his own church, the Church of England. And in England, Bible-believing Christians suddenly get their hopes way up. Oh, we're going to be free. We're going to be able to live by our dictates of our conscience and by the Word of God alone. Didn't pan out that way. Henry's church was built for all the wrong reasons in the beginning, and it ends up worse than Rome. In the 1600s, they're telling British Christians, look, you can believe whatever you want, whatever you want in your head, just don't live it. When it comes time to worship, we will all do exactly the same thing. We're going to live by the Book of Common Prayer. So there were people in the 1600s in England wanted to keep the Sabbath, and they were told, you can't do that, not in the Book of Common Prayer. There were people who wanted to be baptized as Jesus was by immersion. And, you, know, you can't do that, it's not in the Book of Common Prayer. There was no freedom in England, and to avoid being jailed, a lot of what we now call the dissenters in England packed their bags and left. They went somewhere else, people like the early Baptists. People like the Barrowists, who believed you don't need the state's permission on how to run a church. People like the Fifth Monarchists, who read the book of Daniel and said, look, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the Fifth Monarch would be Jesus. They were looking forward to the second coming of Christ. People like the Puritans and the Quakers and the Sabbatarians and all these people who would eventually pass down their beliefs through the generations to us. God's remnant movement. These are our spiritual grandparents. They started to pack their bags and leave England. Where did they go? I'm, I'm pleased to tell you as a Dutch boy that they went to the Dutch Republic. That's where they went. It's the freest country of the day. And when they got to the Netherlands, they ran into another group that was fleeing persecution, the Jews. They were leaving Spain to get away from the Inquisition and moving to the Netherlands. And so they all get together, these British Protestants and these Jews, in the Netherlands. And they begin to compare notes, and for the first time in hundreds of years, Christians begin to read the Scriptures in Hebrew because they're learning Hebrew, and they have access to all these super old commentaries, and as they're going through all that material, they stumble together, these two groups, onto this story we're reading today in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11. This, says God, will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots. You want a king? Okay. But he's going to force you to work for him, and there's going to be military conscription. Is that what you want? Verse 12. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He's going to force you to fight his wars. Is that what you want? Verse 14, he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. There's going to be confiscation and eminent domain and taxes to pay, and you will be his servants. The reformers, the British dissenters are reading this, and they suddenly realize, do you think this is the reason we still have trouble with human kings 2,900 years later? Based on this passage, they begin to dream of a world that doesn't have a king. A place where you could live directly beneath God the way God intended for the children of Israel. This was the hottest topic of debate in the 17th and 18th centuries. Whether or not it was okay to get rid of the king. That was it. Everybody was involved. Go back and read William Blake, the poet. He was against it. He said, no, only Lucifer rebels against the authority of a king. Everybody else was pro. Thomas Hobbes. Some of you were forced to read Leviathan in college. They only ever give you two books of the four in Leviathan to read. The other two are on Bible prophecy. They don't want you to read that. Thomas Hobbes talked about it. John Milton was debating it. John Locke hiding in the Netherlands because they accused him of sedition. They, he wrote the Second Treatise of Government, foundation for this nation. John Bunyan in prison for his beliefs, writing Pilgrim's Progress. They're all debating it. We don't think we were ever supposed to have a king in the church. We don't think so. So they began to pray for a place where God would be the king. And that's when they found another passage, Deuteronomy chapter 17. And they realized, and this is the language they were using in the 1700s, 1600s, Israel used to be a republic. In fact, it used to be a constitutional republic. Why? This is what they were saying. It had no king and it had a supreme written law, the Torah five books of the Bible. Everybody had to live under the supreme written law and there was no king. But Deuteronomy 17, God knew they would one day ask for a king. And so because he's a God of love, he puts up a guardrail for the moment we were going to rebel that way. And here's the guardrail. Deuteronomy 17 verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren. If you're going to have a CEO in this country, then he's got to be a commoner. You may not set a foreigner over you. Can't be foreign-born if he's going to run this country. 
Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. There were checks and balances put in place in an attempt to prevent corruption. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. The king would have to live under the rule of law. Let me ask you a question. Ever heard of a republic where the chief executive officer has to be a commoner and can't be foreign-born? Ever heard of anything like that? Ever heard of a republic where there are deliberate checks and balances trying to prevent corruption, where the ruler must be subject, in theory, to the supreme written law of the land, anything on the planet that looks like that? It's not a coincidence that the American Constitution describes a republic without a king. It is not a coincidence that it guarantees religious liberty under a supreme written law. Where do you think the Founding Fathers got those ideas? Every single one of them had been reading the works of the English dissenters. Every single one of them. Now, they weren't all Christians. There were deists and atheists in the bunch, but they knew this stuff. They got the building blocks for the American Constitution directly out of the Protestant Reformation. That's why Ellen White in Volume 5 of the Testimony says that our Constitution is a Protestant and small-r Republican document. Why she says that? It's because there's this unbroken chain of thought leading directly from the Reformation to the birth of this country. This is the reason the book of Revelation describes this country the way that it does. It says in Revelation 12, the earth would open up and give the persecuted a place to go. That's here. Revelation 13 says this brand new nation would be Christ-like, lamb-like, doesn't even have crowns on its horns like the first beast. Why? Won't have a king. The founders of this country knew exactly what they were building, and I can prove it. In 1787, at the Constitutional Convention, things were getting out of hand. Everybody's arguing, and they're arguing over states' rights, and we got this close to never, ever being a nation, this close, when suddenly, in the middle of the argument, in the middle of all the heat, Benjamin Franklin stands up, and he makes a speech. First, he quotes the Bible something like 10, 11, 12 times perfectly by memory because even though he was a deist, he had the entire Bible memorized. He quotes it by memory, and then he says this, Before I sit down, I will suggest, Mr. President, not the President of the United States, we're too early for that, President of the Convention. Before I sit down, I will suggest, Mr. President, that propriety of nominating and appointing before we separate a chaplain to this convention, whose duty it shall be uniformly to introduce the business of each day by an address to the creator of the universe and the governor of all nations. Who did these people believe was the real king of all nations? Who did these people believe is your only king. If America wasn't going to have a king, it's because the founders knew you already have one and you need to be free to report to him. Up in Newport, Rhode Island, there was a synagogue. Some of the Jewish settlers were panicking. We just created a Christian nation. Now, it wasn't Christian nation. It was a Christian nation, not in the sense that a lot of people use that today where they're pushing for another theocracy. No, it was a Christian nation where you could be free to live by your conscience under Jesus. But they panic because they come over from the old world. They've been persecuted there. What's going to happen to us? And George Washington heard about it. So in 1790, he wrote them a letter to the Newport, Rhode Island synagogue. He said, you're going to be fine here. We're going to leave you alone. Everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there should be none to make him afraid. That's a direct quote from Micah chapter 4, where God describes his eternal kingdom and the way it's going to be there. No more human domination of each other. The Founding Fathers were building a Christian nation, and they knew it. They were attempting to wind the clock back to one minute before Israel asked for a king. And what's interesting about it is the way that Saul, the son of Kish, kind of predicts the fate of this country. Because in the beginning, Saul's lamb-like. Look at him. The Bible says Samuel anoints him privately, but he doesn't get the crown until he proves himself on the battlefield. Just like Jesus, the day he goes back to heaven, Acts 2, verse 33, he's anointed that day, but he doesn't get his kingdom until the controversy is finished and the judgment is over and he's declared king of kings and lord of lords. There's a parallel. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 10, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit and got the gift of prophecy. And of course, Jesus was also filled with the Holy Spirit, descended on him at the beginning of his ministry. There is no question there's a parallel here. Saul, the son of Kish, was lamb-like at first. But then as the story continues, he doesn't look like Jesus anymore. He looks like us. 
He even gets replaced by a Messianic king, David. Two years into his reign, Saul's getting ready to fight the Philistines. He wants to have a sacrifice. But of course, Samuel hasn't come. Samuel is delayed a week, seven days, the perfect delay at second coming language. So Saul says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring fire on this altar myself. Which is exactly what the second beast does, bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men. This nation was a lamb-like nation. It was born exactly on time for the appearance of God's remnant movement. But then over the course of the 20th century, as we rejected the light of the three angels' messages, the character of this country began to shift. It began to change. And it's different now. And now we're a heartbeat from midnight. Testimonies, Volume 5, when our country, page 451, shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and the end is near. Let it sink in. I know some of you in recent years have been tempted. I'm going to get into the fray and fix the government. You're not. You're not going to fix it. It's over. America's not coming back. I just don't know how fast it's going to accelerate. Get out of politics and get back to work. We have not been called to do anything but herald the three angels' messages in these last moments. And I'm telling you, the audience is warmer than I've ever seen it in my life. Get back to work. You're not going to fix it. It's over. Yeah, they're reading your emails. So what? I put stuff in there for them to read. <laughs> yeah, they're listening to your phone calls. So what? I actually say stuff in the phone call to see if I can hear the click on the line. Record away, boys. What does it matter? Yeah, they force people to do things they don't want to do, and they're silencing people who have the wrong opinion. That's just the last few years, and that's the warm-up. Buckle up. I don't care. Let it boil over. Jesus is coming. Bring it on. Get back to work. It's over. It's over. It doesn't matter who wins the next election. Trust me, it doesn't. Oh, it does, Pastor. No, it doesn't doesn't matter at all. You know, at the end of his life, Saul actually has to throw himself on his own sword. He's got to solve his own problems. That's how it goes when you want to sit on the throne. Then you solve your own problems. I don't want it that way. I'll do what God asks because, man, I'd rather he's on the throne anyway. I don't know how you've been over your lifetime, but I have blown it every time I've taken charge. Ask my wife. You know when the Philistines find Saul in the rubble? You know what they do? Cut his head off. Now he's exactly the same height as everybody else. He and everybody like him is not your king. You go forward 1,200 years and you find a man in a dark garden pleading with his father, if it be possible, let it pass for but because there's no escaping the price of your salvation, He lets us take Him and humiliate Him and pull His beard out and spit in His face. And then as He hangs on a Roman cross, He prays for you. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's your king. When I was a young guy, a week ago, I used to cut class at the University of Victoria. Young people, put your fingers in your ears. I used to cut class to go down to the legislative buildings in Victoria, British Columbia to watch question period at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the British parliamentary system. I'd have a class on how it all works, but hey, it's a fused executive legislative function. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the opposition is allowed to question the government for half an hour. I could not wait to get down there because I know Canadians have this reputation. Oh, they're so polite. No, we're not. We're not nice at all. Not even a little bit. Now, you're not allowed to insult anybody on the floor of the house. And so everybody does it through the Speaker of the house. They will get out of their seat and say, hey, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering, is it allowed within the rules of this assembly for me to call the honorable member from so-and-so a complete idiot? 
No, that's not allowed. That's what I thought, sir, and he sits down, you know. Like, oh, I loved it. I was down there every day, every day. I never went to class. It's like, this is fun. And I came down out of there one day, and I came down the stairs out into the rotunda of the legislative building, and there was the premier of the province. That's like the governor. And it's like, that, that, I'd never have seen him except on TV. And he's in a scrum of reporters, and they hate him. Oh, the reporters hated this guy because he owned a biblical theme park. That's why they hated him. <laughs> and they're grilling him, and he looks like he's really uncomfortable. And he looks up and sees me walking through the rotunda looking his way, and he suddenly calls out, Hey, it's really good to see you. He doesn't know me from Adam. It's really good to see you. And he breaks away. Gentlemen, I'm so sorry. I've got to catch up with this guy. And he breaks away from the reporters and comes and puts his arm around me. And I'm a little shell-shocked. I'm 17. You know, I got ripped jeans on, an ACDC t-shirt. It's like, what in the world? It's like, he says, walk with me. Just play along. So we walk down the hallway, out through the doors, across a breezeway, into his executive offices. We go into the lobby of his office, and there are three guys there in suits, and they they stand up, Mr. Premier, it is so nice to see you. I'd never seen any of those guys except on TV. I mean, these were the biggest names I knew of. And he says, gentlemen, please be seated. I'll be right with you. I have something important to do. And he takes me and escorts me into his office and sits me in a chair and closes the door and he says, let's hang out for a while. I don't want to talk to those people anyway. <laughs> and I'm in shock because the most powerful person in the world just walked me into the halls of power and I know I don't belong there. And Jesus says in the kingdom of God, it's the prostitutes and the tax collectors who go in first. Why? They let go of the reins a long time ago. A long time ago. Why do we have so much trouble letting go? I worked for that guy 10 minutes in his office. He let me go. I worked for him for free to the day he left office. For free. And here's Jesus with his arm around you, walking you into the courts of glory, and you know you don't belong there. Here's the interesting thing. You struggle so much to let him run it. But here's what he says. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. You've been trying to build your own kingdom. Sit on the throne once in a while. And all this time he intended to share that throne with you anyway. 